Okay, so today I saw two images that I wanted to look at that were really close to each other um, with the issues that they were facing. So there's this one and this one. Both are in a dark room and both have metallic uh, uh, texture that we have to render. Um, and what I brought up is the this picture of a car. Um, so the point is both have a black background, so both have a really dark environment, black room, nighttime, only the moonlight shining, um, you know, studio light, whatever it might be. Uh, but what we're looking at is a really similar environment to this. Also similar texture. And what I want to show you today in either this one or this one is basically how to render the form as a um, three-dimensional object, so throwing in the contour shadows and and re representing the metallic reflective surface. So when you have a metallic reflective surface that is, you know, like a car hood or armor or, you know, armor again, is um, the, 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 the big deal with it is that you, also, you have to shade it as much as a cube that is mattified um, as you do shade it at the end and accessorize it, with the, accessorize it with the metallic reflections. So you can't choose either or, guys. When you paint something that's reflective, you aren't exempt from the contour shadows. You aren't exempt from the cast shadows. It is still an opaque object. Um, so what do I mean by that? Can anyone answer my question? What does an opaque object mean as a form structure? What, what does it technically mean? What's the big deal about an opaque object? What does the word opaque mean? Anyone have any answers? <clears throat> opaque, not see-through. So there's the start. And what does that mean when we have sh light shining on an object that is not see-through? It just means not see-through. It just means it's like hard, dense, d it's not see-through in any way. You, can, you cannot see through it like a wall of concrete. Okay, so yes, thank you, Addo. Hard edges. Um, it's not about reflectivity, Acarlis, because um, reflectivity is the second layer that we have to think about. So whenever you are shading anything at all that is reflective, you have to think about its density first. You have to think about it as a matte object shade it as a matte object and after you're done shading it as a mattified object you add in and accessorize it with the reflective surfaces so my biggest critique for this necromancer drawing that is not finished specified <laughs> some of you do that some of you say not finished so like you know it's not finished so don't even try it <laughs> don't even try to critique <laughs> um, even if it's not finished I'm gonna, I'm gonna rip it up I'm joking um, so for a lot of this stuff here what I see is more reflectivity not a solid light source direction. A little bit of staging issues um, with the where, where where he's placed. His head is all the way at the end of the canvas near the top. He needs some head space behind him. Um, oh, he's a gradient, bro. And, uh, and f of course, the fact that you've shaded, including the matte object, so including the, 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 the fabric, you've shaded it with a you know, directionless, general, universal, diffused in all manners light source. I see no cast shadows, and I see no highlight points pointing to a light source uh, source uh, for the reflective objects, and I see that the reflective objects are not shaded as if they are mattified uh, solid opaque objects first. So, um, uh, so what you have to do first and foremost is forget that it's reflective start shading it as if it is a cube so I'm just gonna get a big blob of black right here and I'm just gonna throw it over everything I know if the light was coming from the top the light won't touch so there are some areas the light will touch but there are areas that won't areas on his face areas on the bandages of his face cast shadows solid cast shadows on his face from the hood <clears throat> Alright, so already we have a sense of depth, already we have a sense of layering, a sense of um, sort of, let me try to get rid of this.
And that's where it doesn't allow me to anymore. Really? Okay. Fine. So what I did right now is I darkened the background. I'm going to push it up just a little bit. Just a tiny, tiny bit. He is technically in a really dark room and there is a single light source. So imagine you're like in one room and there's only one light source behind you. How really visible will you be and how distinct will you be from the background? That's really the point here, is that we're trying to unify the, 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 the three-dimensional object with its background, with its environment, reflecting the light source as it affects the environment as well as the main object. So I'm getting rid of that gradient and I'm just dealing with this, uh, cutting this canvas, nope, cutting this canvas off a little early. You don't need it to stretch that far ahead, maybe a little longer for the sake of original design. Okay, so after shading it, then you start really introducing the metallics, but we still have to think about it as a 3D object first. So what I'm going to be doing now is dealing with these units here, these little arm armor pieces, as individual cubes stacking on each other. So I'm casting a shadow under each one responding to the light source above. So there, nothing is exempt from shading realistically. <laughs> nothing. That's it. That's the simple way to put it. If you are thinking about the light source as the dominant sort of physics or the law of physics that is most dominant in this sort of image, and you, you, you won't forget to appreciate it to that level where everything in this case is, is shaded around. So the top of his, his shoulder, shoulder pads are going to get some light on them because that's where the light is coming from. So I'm not sure if you guys see it in your minds. Uh, I'll show it to you in a second. Exactly where the lights are coming from. And it's okay if it's too metallic right now because I can always bring it down a notch and then re-highlight, directing back to the main, main light source. So with this car as my reference, you can see that the light was coming from above the car. And so if the light was coming from above here off camera, and it was shining down. This highest point of contrast, this is the highest point of contrast right here where the light is the lightest. You see, it's, it's not even in no man's land. That's how, no, how, how rare no man's land is. But over here, it's pretty bright and pretty white. Over here, the whites aren't even that light all the way down here. And so this highlight and this rect reflectivity is only used in the most exposed areas. And the car is still subject to a coarse shadow. It's not, the whole car isn't glowing in the dark because it's reflective. It still has a core shadow on it. So no matter what, as long as the object is opaque, it's going to be um, subject to contour shadows and cast shadows. And if the light was a little bit more intense, we'd actually see the cast shadow of the car on the ground beneath it. They probably edited it out for, for, for like, a, you know, dramatic purpose. But the most contrast is, is, is the area that is closest to the light and the most exposed, the flattest surface area. Side. Of the uh, of the wheel hood thingy, only the side is lit because the side is facing that light source. So what I see in my mind's eye is a bunch of light rays coming out, and only the areas that are exposed to them, such as this surface area, this surface area, this surface area, the top of this surface area, a little bit of here, a little bit of here, are exposed. Therefore, they only get the light. So this is exactly the same thing. Think about the light source as coming from above which areas are going to be exposed to the light source and which areas are not. And the closest areas, which is the head, the head is the closest, it should be the most illuminated. Or, you know, relative to the kind of reflectivity in the in the in the in that mat in that material and that it may not be metallic, it might not be silky, it might be a really mattified um uh, fabric nonetheless, it should have some level of, of light on it that represents how close his head is to the light compared to his shoulder blade or shoulder pads even though they're reflective. So at this point I'm going to shade one last time. Just throw a big shadow over top everything. 
get the darkest color in the room and just throw it over everything adding light only where we know we need it so the light in this case is needed I'm just gonna make this a symmetrical reflection I would add some light to the top of his nose bridge right here some of that is gonna get some light a little bit on his cheekbones a little bit on the sides right above his lips or lack thereof little bit on the chin but everything else just like I always do in portraiture these are just the light spots in portraiture everything else is in shadow so is everybody with me does everybody know what I'm talking about anyone explain in one sentence what it is that I'm doing bye Devin Equalizing the light. What does that mean? What does that really mean? Stronger light at the top, diffusing as it goes down. That's one thing that I'm doing. Balancing the light versus dark, lowering the contrast. That's another one thing that I'm doing. But that's not the principle, what it is that I'm teaching here. What am I teaching you about? What is the purpose of this exercise? Shading it first without making it reflective first. Yes. How am I shading it? Bringing the shadows to a more realistic value. The square. The cube, yeah. How? So this is why I ask you guys these questions, because I, I need to know that you guys know what I'm talking about. How am I shading it? What's, wh how do I know where to shade? So someone already said it. How will I know where to shade? Indicate, indicate plane changes. Yes! Darkening the areas, not touching the light area, lighting the areas that are most facing the light. Yes. Um, like one of the basic forms cube. Mm -hmm. Highest point. Mm -hmm. You specified a light source at the top and are casting shadows from there of the form. Um, the responding to the light source, that's true. Change the values according to the distance and angle of surface. Yes. It's spot on. You guys got it. <laughs> that's exactly what I'm doing. I'm shading around the cube structures. I mean, uh, you know, shading around, um, thinking about everything as a cube or a polygon or a series of polygons stuck together. And out of that, I know exactly where to shade. So the, the tops of his shoulder blades leading down towards the ends of them these areas are going to be the lightest and what happens with reflective surfaces is they're just they're not just reflective they are they work as a light source on their own because of their ability to reflect so what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a little bit of glow at the sides where the light is strongest you see what that did I'm also going to bring in some more illumination at the top, right there, right at the top of his head, which is where the light is flooding in. And I'm going to bring in some light over here, some light over here. And that's what reflective surfaces do. They do that little, that little bit of glow that they do. And so now this whole piece is responding to a light source. And nothing is too rounded at the edges, which is a look that sometimes you guys have in your work. That's not a really good look because it shows that you guys are shading around nothing. I mean, you're not thinking about any cube at all. That's really bad news. It's not good. So these reflective surfaces, the little glows I just added, are acting as a light source on their own. So what do I do with them? Does anyone, does anyone know what I do with this? I just added a light source. These are two tiny little light sources. What do we call light sources 
that are not the primary light source. What do we call them? Does anybody know? Secondary light sources. They will illuminate around. Yes. No, not tertiary. Secondary light sources. Absolutely. I'm very proud of you guys. So the secondary light source here, what it will do is it will illuminate the sides that are subject to the core shadow or you know that are the core shadow so I'm just gonna throw a big blob and erase what I don't need and I'm gonna eyeball it so I can't make it so bright that the secondary light source is no primary light source is no longer valid and I cannot make it so so dark that it's not really a good representation of how the core shadow has been diffused so I will, I will probably shrink its intensity and its stretch so it's not gonna stretch that far ahead and now I'm going to pretend like all of the lines are coming out of this, just like that. And so what will interrupt them? Well, this little ridge will interrupt the lines right here. This little valley will interrupt the lines. And so now we're shading. It's the same rules apply. There are no new rules. It's the same rules that apply everywhere else. And now I'm just going to zoom out, make sure that I'm not interrupting the core shadow in any immediate way. And I'm just being extra careful around the form. I want to shade around a cube, the, 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 the actual curvature of the cube that is his hat or his hood. I don't want to ruin it. I want to complement it. So that's what I'm doing right here, is I'm just trying my best to avoid flattening the image. So the secondary light source, some of you confuse it as an outline or some sort of rim light. It's not. It's an extra bit of shading, an extra bit of contours on the sides. So don't think that it's a chance to start, um, chance to start outlining your image. No, you're just going to flatten it. That isn't going to do anything for you. I'm just shading around these little these little ridge thingies. This little bit here is metallic and reflective, so the sides of this will get catch some light. Gotta shrink my brush. Just like that on the sides. And look at how this form is now you know, coming to life. It's responding to its uh, actual physics. Because we know what the physics does. We know how it acts. We know what it likes to do. So it's become very simple for us to just act like there is three dimensions here. That's what we're doing at the end of the day. Remember, this is what I always say. We are trying to imitate what happens in three dimensions on a two-dimensional medium, which is our canvas. This isn't 3D. This isn't a 3D modeling program. This is a 2D drawing program or editing program called Photoshop. It is not in any ways designed to work with the third dimension. So we have to act like we, we, we have access to the third dimension. And so this nice little curve is visible to me now, this like little curve just like that. It's not going to be that intense though. What I'm going to do is erase away at it and keep only where I, what I need. And that's sort of the key to getting the perfect amount of illumination onto a reflective surface. It's just keep erasing away and keep only what you need. It's only at the top we really need it. Only at the highest point, the most reflective point. So I just dodge tooled a lot, but what I'm just doing is just bringing it down one more grade. Really, really stingy about my use of, of, of highlights just like that really delicately it's too big a piece just like this and then at the top and then I'm going to sharpen because I kind of got rid of your details a little <clears throat> And when you sharpen, there is an added, added uh, contrast. So I'm just going to bring the values down 
a notch. And so now what we have left as the cube, so what basically what I mean by cube, does anybody here not see the cube? Does anyone in the audience or the, in, in the class <laughs> not see the cube in front of them right now? Is anyone having trouble knowing what I'm talking about when I say cube? Yeah, and that's really Van Sparrow. That's like sort of a technique that you can use to help frame better. Because he's such a, you know, he's such a sort of divine, not really divine, but he's some sort of important uh, person. So you want to give him a bit of a halo or an anti-halo or whatever you call it. Does anyone here, I'm sorry about my slurping, does anyone here not see the cube? Anybody? Anybody? <clears throat> All right, I'm waiting. No? <laughs> Everyone sees the cube. Well, tell me if you don't so I show you. <laughs> you observe in spheres. What do you mean? I observe in... That's not good. Don't observe in spheres. Don't do that because then you're going to draw bubble butts for the rest of your life. Bubble drawings and bubble butts. What do you mean? Uh, I mean... So, yeah, as long as you're saying, what do you mean? You don't know what I mean. All right, so the cube that I'm talking about, the main cube. All right, let me simplify it as much as possible. All right, so this is cube number one. It's kind of an odd cube. That's why I call them polygons, because, you know, the world is organic. This is cube number one, if you can call it a cube. All right, this is cube number two. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> okay, it's not really a cube, I guess we can do this, yeah, 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 it's a cube, it's a cube, it's a cube, all right, okay, this is cubes numbers two and three and four, three and four, not two, three and four, all right, and then to simplify the whole thing, it's just one big one big cube. All right, so that means that light comes down this way, this gets illuminated, all of this is dark. Light, light. So let me get my white. Light, 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 light. Light, light, light. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> God damn it. And then dark, 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 dark. This is what I mean by cube. The, the, the third dimension, the, the, the z-axis, what have you. And so this, these cubes will guide you if you don't know where to shade. If you come to me, hey, Ista, I don't know how to shade. Where do I shade, man? Hook me up with some shading. I would say, um, uh, I would say, Find the cube, and once you find the cube, where's your light source? You gotta have the light source, or else, you know, just give up on art entirely. And I don't like saying that to people. Of course not. That's why I'm here. Um, so, find the light source, and after that, it just all falls into place. You just have to shade around, find that top face. And the reason why, everyone listen, everybody listen. This is the key. The reason why you have to find the cube, okay, is because of this beautiful little edge right here. Okay, that edge tells you where to stop. It's okay. Past this point, it's over. There no longer needs to be any more light. It's vital that you stop, actually. We actually want you to stop. Because if you don't, and you keep shading and shading and shading, it will make zero sense. Okay? So that's why I want you guys to see the cube. Because it'll tell you where to stop. Right? Where to place and where to stop. What did I just say? Everyone write it back to me. What did I just say? <laughs> I know, I did it on purpose so that I could <laughs> so that I could attract your attention. That's why I was talking like that. I was trying to seduce you into the world of edges. Yeah. 
Use the cube, it'll tell you when to start and stop. Yes. What better <laughs> than something telling you when to shade and when not to shade when you draw? Is that, isn't that what we all want? Like a voice in our head that tells you, okay, put light here, um, put a little bit of lines here, okay, put a little bit of red right there. Like, don't, doesn't everybody want like a, like a autopilot? The cube is your autopilot in art. All right. I, I'm drinking tea. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I shan't ever again draw a sphere ever unless it is an actual sphere. Yes. And promise, promise yourself that, Ado. Don't just say it for the spirit of the moment. Promise yourself that you'll start seeing the cube. The cube is the best because the cube is the only shape you can trust that will always, always, always exemplify the z-axis in its, in its dimensions in, in drawing the cube. You are drawing the z-axis whenever you draw the cube. All right? Z, Y, X. So this is the key. This is the key to drawing realistic creatures is thinking about the z-axis and the depth in, in the world that they live in. And so, you know, back to math class. X, Y, Z, and the cube. The cube is the only shape you can trust that will always remind you of the z-axis. And that's important because it tells you where to stop. It tells you which side is, is facing the secondary light source like we did right here. It tells you which part is completely not facing anything like we did right here. Look at that. It's telling me where to put everything. How amazing is that? That's what you guys need to start doing. See it. See. Do you see? Alright, so let me finish with the sleeve. It's over-introduced sleeve. Self-important sleeve. I'm adding just the general light of that area as if it was one single brush stroke and now I'm just going to get like a brush that'll help me render the folds a little bit better. So, just going to do that. <clears throat> okay. And then get the, you know, maybe it's like reflective in certain areas. Like only in the highest points, I guess, of the of the sleeve, I'm trying to just get some light. No, it's still not. <clears throat> so use the dodge tool for time. Just at the very tops. And then this arm, this hand is way too light. And it seems to be pretty uninteresting compared to the deadly intricacies of his upper body. This hand seems to be really boring. Um, either dress it up with like a thousand and one rings or give it some level of intrigue or else don't don't even, because it was pretty light and it was surrounded by dark. All the attention was just going straight to this. So unless you want the hand to be that important a piece in this composition, because it's not finished as you have it specified, um, you should just bring that down. Also, you're leading the eye away from all this work. So get rid of those shades over here. Darken that up only in the area that is lightest. And that's the area that will get all this. Right, so I'm going to get my soft brush and just continue to erase away at what I don't need, choosing the darkest color in the room and just bringing everything down. Highlights are bird poop, as I have said. It's become my new motto. I thank my friend for introducing me to that. I also cast a shadow on this little piece here. You had a little piece that wasn't shaded. It was just escaping. So I cast a shadow on that. So now what we have, we're seeing a nice beautiful pattern. You know, these, these, these circles in this image. And if you want more secondary light sourcing, by all means, bring them in. If you want to cast some more form, um, you can throw them right over top. All of this, just make sure that you are shading around. You don't just plop it on. Make sure you are shading around it. But uh, for me, I would just darken the background a grade lower and make him really part of his environment. And finally, finally, one last little pretty little glamour touch, which you need is that that light coming from above. 
right above him. So you don't want to make it so that it illuminates his background too much. So you want to be careful. But you also want it still there to prove that there's a light source illuminating the air or the dust around. I'm going to blur the back of his head. And I'm going to bring in another layer on top with the same light and I'm just going to throw it over. And what will happen is we'll get that that bleed. And I'm going to erase away what I don't need. All right, so now there's an environment. There's an environment here. That's really, really good. That's what we need. A little bit more illuminations on the sides. You might want to bring in some detail, some sort of like design on his little headpiece right there. Um, let me see if I can do one real quick. Sorry. Just had tuna salad. <laughs> <clears throat> sharpen, 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 sharpen. Do it. Ugh, never mind. I give up. Maybe if I do this? Nope. Alright. This image is now flattened. Nope, nope. Just gotta finish a little bit more. Right, so I'm going to show you the before and after. You're going to see staging problems. So you're going to see his head all the way at the top here, trying to fly away. You don't want to do that because you want to direct all the attention back at this fella and his story. Okay, I'm just going to illuminate the tops just a little bit more on his hand. You might want to get some references for his hand as well. Um, one last little framing thing. Just darkening the bottom because the further you are from the light source, the darker everything is. And so the, the bottom half of this canvas should also be dark, whereas the top is a little better. What the heck is happening? Stupid Photoshop. Okay. So, before, you shaded him really generally. Um, I'm not even sure like where he was in all of this. You know, what kind of room is he in? He's really, really, really flat, flat. And I can't just sit here and say, hey, you draw flat. I'm not going to be able to sleep at night if I teach like that. I have to, you know, introduce you to the cube and that's why you're drawing flat. It's not because you don't know how to draw or that you have no drawing spirit. This is a beautiful drawing. It's a beautiful, you know, story behind it. It tells the story. Um, issue was that he wasn't part of any environment. You were designing for designing's sake. You need to start in including your characters in an environment. And the best way to involve your character in an environment, even if it's an empty room, it doesn't, an environment doesn't have to be some sort of intricately furnished landscape. Um, it, it, it can be an empty room. Environment can sometimes be wholly controlled by the light source and the behavior of the light source. All right. So before, after. This is the kind of stuff you want to make if you want to work for like Blizzard or you want to, you know, do the next Diablo CD cover. Um, and you know, this is the kind of stuff they eat up because they want someone who can create an environment and an atmosphere. Not only creating a character but throwing them in, in an atmosphere. Um, looks a lot like the Diablo. After doing this lighting, looks a lot like the Diablo three stuff. So the same thing applies here, the exact same thing. You want to think about the object as a three-dimensional cube with shadows of its own. So if you think about the head here as a cube, though, if we know, we know that if the head was a cube, this entire side would be a shadow. Alright, it's so okay if you paint away some stuff, you can paint it, paint it back. The entire side of this little helmet thingy would be in shadow. And then what wouldn't be in shadow is this top piece 
We will erase away what we don't need, the top of his little ear. The highest most point of his helmet, where if it touches the eye, it touches the eye, it doesn't matter, it's just the highest point. And then we might have some cast shadows from the helmet piece, that little doohickey. And then some reflected light source on the side. So you see it's like a beautiful relationship. And already this, this headpiece is already like sticking out. It's already, it already has some, some in intrigue to it. Sharpen that for detail. And you see how instantly it became part of an environment. See how important it is to think about the cube? I'm not some like computer program that just critiques. I I'm a human just like you guys. Um, and I will get lost, and I do get lost in paintings. What guides me around my paintings is the cube. And I discovered this way too late in my journey. And you know what I used to call the cube? I didn't even know what to call it. I didn't even call it a cube. I called it like the far away, the part that moves away from you, the far away part. <laughs> I was talking about the side of the cube. I wasn't, you know, my English, English wasn't my first language, so <laughs> spare me. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, we're going to see the side of the other side of the helmet that has some light on it. This side is going to reflect on this side. And so I'm treating it both as a reflective surface and as an, an object that is, that is three-dimensional. Okay? I'm going to have a little bit of scratches here. Oh, breaks and blemishes. <clears throat> Basic, this, this is your, cube is your bread and butter. The cube is your life. If you want to get better at drawing, think about the cube. Alright, so I'm going to shade the bottom of his helmet. This piece is going to cast a shadow on this piece. Again, thinking about cubes and stacking. Basic, basic form structure rules. Finding the highest point over here. Throwing it back up. A little bit is on this side. And then I'm just going to throw a big shadow on top because it's not that light. Merge it with the background and then get my dodge tool again and just keep erasing at the highlights, placing them only where you really need them. And do you see the realism that is instantly visible? And at that, you know, you can place some stylistic little glows over here for the um, for the headpiece. Again, another staging issue, way too high on the canvas. And to bring it down so that the eyes have a chance, so the eyes don't have to look up in order to see this guy. Um, English isn't my first language. Yeah, uh, Arabic is my first language. Eventually, English became my main language, but Arabic is my mother tongue. Yes, I am terrorist. <laughs> joking. <laughs> oh, I'm joking, I'm joking. <laughs> my Arab followers are going to hate me now. <clears throat> All right, so high points and low points. Treating even the hair is being treated as everyone pay attention. Who gives a crap about them? What language I speak? <laughs> Shukran Habibi. Oh, thank you, Nutriman. Um, even the hair at this point can be treated as a cube. You just think about the side that's not facing the light, the sides that are. You can shade anything. This whole piece here on the horse is going to be dark, and like the high point right over here right around where his hand and his little thingy reach a high point that also gets some light on it. His hoof or his leg or whatever. <laughs> I should really pick up a dictionary. Um, all of this gets illuminated and again just bring it down just to be safe. and adding some more. So what am I doing here? Again, what, what can anyone tell me the basic name for what I'm doing right now? Right, maybe some light will come in and illuminate the belly area of the horse. And that way he doesn't just com get completely faded into core shadow. Because he will, and we don't want that because we're trying to design a composition here. We're trying to have everything visible so that it can be appreciated. So what we're doing right now is trying to reveal the form 
on all sides. So we do need some secondary diffuse lights. We do, because that, that core shadow can be a bit flooding and it can be a bit greedy. And what you want to do is assist the form by throwing in a, a secondary light source or two. Right, so a little bit on the side of the horse there. And you see the horse emerging? Does everybody see this? Does everybody see this? The horse is coming out of the background. It's, it's, it's feeling 3D. So yes, I'm showing the the planes. This I'm reading from the from the class right now for people on YouTube. Showing the planes, executing lighting on a cube-ish form. There is another cubing movie. Casting primary shadows, <laughs> light sources, adding ambient occlusion. Yeah, I don't like the movie too. What Chris said, adding in atmosphere. Yes, casting the light on the planes of the cubes, polygons, which are the lightest, and pay attention to the edges. Yes. Oh, which is a horsey? Yes. <clears throat> okay. So before we added that, after we added that, we got a lot of form out of those, those secondary light sources that we added. And of course, there's always a clash between the secondary light source and the, and the core shadow, and there's that little bit of darkness that happens. Same with this dude. If you don't know where to shade, treat him as a cube. The top part of his helmet will get the light. His face will be in some darkness. Maybe his chin will get some light on it, but that's probably about it. You shaded his face too much. Just because a face is in the image doesn't mean it'll, it'll carry the image for you. It's not your ADC. Your ADC is your form. A cube is your ADC. <laughs> also look up like how spheres um, reflect. There's like two main reflective glows on spheres. There's like the reflected light and then the core shadow light or something. I mean the core light. Right, so what's your ADC? Everybody? What's your ADC, guys? The cube, yes. Good for you. Brom is here. Brahma is also the ADC. He'll carry you. I mean, he'll support you. And then these little doohickeys here will cast some shadows. <clears throat> good, good. <laughs> and then the top of those little spikes will get some light on them. You see how this pretty little horse is emerging? Because your cube tells you what to do. It's telling me what to do. Just trying to continue that. Erase. Keep myself zoomed out. Why do I zoom out? Why, why, why? Does anybody know why I'm zoomed out? Can anybody answer? Check composition. Is that really only the reason why you zoom out? Are you sure? Ear is casting a shadow as well, so I'm just throwing that in there. Get lost in the de not to not get lost in the details. What does that mean, Boo Pen? So you look at it as a whole. Value check. Yes. So getting lost in the details means that this is great when we put our heads together because we can just answer any question. Um, getting lost in the details means that you will be over sort of giving too much attention or investing too much importance into the detail thinking that the detail will carry the, 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 the read, thinking the detail will read for you, will, will make it read. Well, that's not true in any way, shape, or form. You can make an image completely void of detail. Remember those painterly, beautiful things that those masters do? 
they're painterly as all hell, but they, 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 they read for some reason. They just work. When you zoom out, you're like, shit, is that a photograph? That's because the details do squat when it comes down to it. It's all about the value spectrum, the way you've balanced your composition. You know what I used to say before I learned any of this stuff? I used to say, why does their image look good zoomed out, and why does mine look shitty zoomed out? <laughs> I used to have zero vocabulary, zero art vocabulary. That's unfortunate if a student is experiencing that, especially if all the resources of the world are out there waiting for you. So the reason why I'm here is because I, I, I don't want you <laughs> to experience what I experienced growing up as an artist. I was shitty. I got my first computer when I was like 18 <laughs> or 17, I forget. But, but you, you, none of you have any excuses right now. None of you have an excuse for why you guys aren't improving, if you aren't. If you are, keep doing what you're doing, and you'll get there. <clears throat> As for my technique, the specific technique I'm using right now, I'm just using layers and then erasing away what I don't need. It gives me a lot more control. And then after I'm done, I just merge down. I kind of feel like unifying this piece and this piece, but I don't think that'd be very helpful for the horse. I don't think that would make sense. So yeah, I'm just going to merge all and then just lighten this. Alright, so see what happened to the horse? It's now part of an environment. <clears throat> No hover rendering, yes, to avoid details that are unnecessary, yes. You can see the cube better when you're zoomed out, yes. Yes, yes, yes. Sorry about that, Bill Clinton, yes. <clears throat> All right, so let us look at the before and after. Um, shit. Levels are too plummeted. Okay. After. Before. There was shading, but the shading was around your visual library shading. Probably like a cube or a cup that you wanted to distill life of. And you brought it into this image. And after we're shading like a cube. There is some detail loss, unfortunately, but I don't have time to do the details. But look at that head, how it emerges. Just that individual, that that bit of head, that, that, that the horse head is pretty much the only thing we got to finish. But just comparing that before, after. It's really part of that dramatic environment in there. And then you can just start introducing some more reflective lights. So this piece here would be reflective. This reflects onto that, right over here near the bottom of the horse's head, near the bottom here and a little bit here. This little piece reflects over here, and we're getting that little bit of light. I mean, it's just a big relationship. It's a big complicated web that you're just going to have to, you know, map around. But you have to start with the core light first. You have to start with the core shapes first, and all of that other stuff will fall right into place. It's the glow. Do not forget the glow. This is a secondary light source, meaning that it has so much light, so efficiently reflected back, it has its own little glow. Right? This is drama. This sells. This, this, you know, this is this is something that you want in your work. All of that is created by appreciating the the cube just a little bit more. <clears throat> also, if there's like this light, then the light will probably catch some of the um, the breath of the horse. So that'd be really cool if you like threw the breath and then cast a shadow on it. That'd be cool. And like just cast a big shadow on the breath. Just like that. Yeah. Yeah. That's good right there. <laughs> Art is nice. It's nice. <clears throat> we 
I just want to make it seem like it's coming out of the, the nose of the horse. Sometimes I have too much fun with your stuff, you guys. <laughs> So I'm just thinking about the shadow of that man cutter. <clears throat> Everyone obeys the cube. Reflective light is in, a, is in a relationship with the secondary light source, but it's complicated. Yes. <laughs> Everything obeys the cube. Um, art is hard. Yeah. Yeah, it is. But, you know, after you get the basic rules down, there's only so many rules you have to learn. It's not like you have to learn, you know, calculus. There's only so many rules, observable sciences that you have to learn that you, you, you just have to memorize. After that, you stamp them on your desktop, stare at them for one or two years, and you learn them and you become, you know, on your way to be a master. It's not, it's not rocket science. It isn't. And it's not that hard either. I think we make it hard on ourselves because we think a great deal of art is is propelled by creativity. And because we're so stuck with that notion, um, we forget that we need to improve and there's a great deal of science involved. And some people have this false idea that art is entirely disconnected from sciences. Um, you know, mathematical sciences and, and the physical sciences and all of that. Um, that, that that's not true. It's one hundred percent a part of it, because we, as the eyes, are observing the physics happening ahead of us. And if we want to reproduce these physics in their three-dimensional realm onto our two-dimensional surface, we have to learn how to read the physics that's happening in front of us. That means that we are looking at the physics happening, and we are reading it back. Take a photo and show it to a scientist. All right. If anyone has a scientist in their life, do this. Take a photo and, and show it to a scientist and ask the scientist, how much physics do you see? Um, basically, just ask a physicist to look at a photo. And, and, and they'll just throw a big list at you. They'll throw a big list at you. They'll tell you, well, there's light and there's color theory and there's thermodynamics happening over there. And then there's the, you know, um, convex and concave mirrors over there in the window of that shop. And, um, and then there's like, you know, that atmospheric phase that happens in the distance that because the density of the atmosphere has this, 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 and this molecule. Um, and it, because of the density of the atmosphere, that plane over there can fly because the density is that deep that a f plane that, that heavy um, can float if it has enough fuel. It'll, it'll, it'll just throw a bunch of shit at you. There's only, you know, you, you, there's only some of that list that you really need in order to create recreate that photograph. If you want to learn how to duplicate that photograph, don't go to an artist. Don't go to an art book. Don't go to a master. Go to a physicist. A physicist will tell you how to reproduce that image. They'll tell you about perspective. They'll tell you about the, 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 the horizon line, the surface of the earth, why everything, why it's rounded if you're, if you're taking a photo from a plane. Why is it rounded? They'll tell you why the sky is blue. Why specifically in that part of the day the sky is that blue. It's no longer learning the color and then memorizing it and then reusing blue every time you paint sky. No, it's about choosing that exact perfect atmospheric blue. A scientist is going to help you do that. Not an artist, not some other guy's style, not your neighbor, unless your neighbor is a scientist. Okay? So does everyone know what that, that metaphor that I just gave you guys? Does everyone understand what I'm saying? Because that's pretty much the highest level of, of um, explanation I can give anybody about anything. It's like I've, I've taken it to, you know, that, that's the furthest level I can go in explaining this to you guys. And I, I hope that that, that, um, that found a place in your minds and your hearts and, and that you're going to take it seriously. You know, it is all fun and, and sometimes, but at other times, if you really want to improve, there's a great deal of daunting work ahead of you. And if you don't take it seriously, it won't take you seriously. <clears throat> Thanks for the sad out cycle things from a different perspective with this in mind. Yeah. I, I really hope I see like amazing improvement from you guys because of this. <clears throat> know why the world works and I shall become a master. <laughs> um, people like making stupid excuses like art does not obey any rules. <laughs> Do you even science, bro? <laughs> Do you even lish? No, but I science. Yeah, it, there is a great uh, part of art that is about breaking rules and knowing which rules to break and which ones you really need. 
and that out of that your your style is formed but you can't learn you know consciously break a decent and, and form a decent style out of it if you don't know the rules yet so just remember the importance of the of science in your lives and that the science is, isn't going to hurt you it isn't going to it's advancing us we as the science as a really advanced um peoples in front in an advanced age have no excuse not to draw good <laughs> we all have to draw good because that's that's where we're, we have all the knowledge accessible to us all right so bye bye <laughs>